entertaining as this may be, I'm, I'm sure the lecture is going to be even more entertaining. So uh, uh, Rob Grice will speak to us about Laplacians and network sheaves. Thank you very much, uh, Constantine. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this and putting it at a time that is uh, very reasonable for someone in the East Coast US. And uh, thanks to you in the audience for sitting through what might be a talk that's a little different than some of the other talks that you'll see, but which is hopefully resonant with them. Now, I'm going to be talking about sheaves and applications of sheaf theory. This is even for uh, mathematicians, not necessarily something that one can universally assume a background in. So in order to make this talk as accessible as possible, we will not only have subtitles, but we will also have a very, very stripped down, simple version of sheaf theory on display today. You don't really have to have any technical background in this area at all to appreciate 99% of what we do. For my purposes, sheaves are data structures. They're algebraic data structures that are tied to or tethered to some base space. And for, again, 90% of everything we do this morning, it's going to be the simplest possible case. These base spaces are going to be just a graph, a network, uh, higher dimensional cell complexes. Yeah, we can work with those too, but everything is going to be in a cellular setting. And the data that we attach to these cells are going to be very, very simple algebraic data. That is vector spaces and linear transformations. So very, very straightforward stuff. We'll turn the dials and generalize it a little bit later. But for now, you can visualize everything that is about to happen as having a collection of vector spaces and linear transformations that mirrors a graph. In general, that base space that is downstairs, we're going to call a base space. It's usually going to be a graph, could be a higher dimensional cell complex. The data that lives on top of it, these are stocks. So we attach a vector space to every vertex. We attach a vector space to every edge, and we tie the whole thing together with linear transformations. Now, we don't need to have our base space be a graph. It's almost just as easy to use any halfway decent cell complex, in which case we can very simply define a sheaf valued in the category of vector spaces as a functor from the face poset to that category. So again, you've got vector spaces attached to each simplex, each cell. They don't have to be the same vector space. They can vary in dimension widely. And they don't have to be tied together with isomorphisms or identity maps. You can have any kind of linear transformations you want, tying these together as long as it satisfies the conditions for being a functor. So if you do this, then that, or this, then that, you get to the same place. I like to think of these stocks as encoding data that respects the structure of the base space. I like to think of these linear transformations as the programmable part of the sheaf, where you can program in compatibility constraints between the data. Now, these are called sheaves. If you do sheaf theory for a living, you're wondering where's the sheaf condition, where's the gluing condition. In the cellular world, it, it doesn't matter. You don't need it. It is super, superfluous. Well, I wonder what the translation is going to do to that. Oh, it worked. I'm so happy. <laughs> so we can avoid most of the complexities of traditional sheaves over a topology of open sets. Now, one thing you might wonder is, well, why are we going from vertex data to edge data to two-cell data? Why not reverse everything? We can do that. And as per the usual convention in category theory, we call that a co-sheaf. We just reverse all of the arrows, change our functor from covariant to contravariant. There we go. I'm not going to be using co-sheaves today, but if you care about things like persistent homology, 
oh, I see, I need to train this thing to know the word co-sheaf. Oh, well, this is an untrained experimental model. Sorry about that. If you care about persistent homology, you might care more about co-sheaves than sheaves. We're going to stick with sheaves. Now, why? Well, simplicial complexes have homology. And we've been seeing and hearing in these talks over and over and over again how the homology of complexes is useful in so many different settings. The thing that I find most compelling about sheaves is that they have a very natural cohomology associated to them. What we can do is take a sheaf on a cell complex and build up a co-chain complex by bundling together all of the data over all of the different cells using the dimension of the cells as a grading. So we take all of the vector spaces over all the vertices, just take a product of them into one big vector space, do the same thing with the edges, the same thing with the two cells, the three cells, et cetera. You can define a co-boundary operator in the same way as you do for a cell complex, but now instead of just going from uh, vertices to edges, you're using the maps that you use within the sheaf to go from all of that vertex data to all of that edge data. Given such a sheaf, given that coaching complex, you do kernels mod image and voila, you have a nice well-defined cohomology that represents or captures not only the topological features of the base space downstairs, but of the data structure upstairs. So if you think that homology and cohomology of cell complexes is useful, then imagine what you could do with fairly arbitrary data structures sitting over top of them. Now, the intuition is a, a little bit more involved. It's simplest to see what's going on in dimension zero, as always. In this case, the zeroth cohomology is not just giving you connected components of the base space downstairs. It's also giving you the number of independent connected solutions in the data structure upstairs. So you could have a, a very highly connected base space downstairs, but your data structure could have lots of disconnected independent solutions, and it could have lots of zero dimensional cohomology. These are often called uh, global sections of the sheaf, and we will be seeing them used repeatedly for the remainder of the talk. Again, 90% of what we're going to do, the base space is one dimensional. You could just think in terms of vertices and edges, and you're going to be fine. But know that you can do higher dimensional stuff. Now, are these sheaves applied? More importantly, are they useful for anything? I think the answer is a strong yes. These cellular sheaves that seem to have been invented almost accidentally over and over in various forms in the literature. If you go back to the early 90s, Bilera was using what he called some weird homology theory to classify spaces of splines. He was really looking at Cauchy homology in a cellular setting. Earlier than that, I think it was back in the 80s, Kahn was using a co-sheaf to understand things about graphic statics. There have been other historical antecedents of people using sheaves in different contexts, but these have been all sort of uh, isolated. It's really within the past 15 years or so that there's been very coordinated and spectacular progress. Everything from Yasu Hiroka and his work on network coding to a lot of really cool stuff involving relationships to persistent homology. Cheyenne Mukherjee in the next talk is gonna be explaining some really exciting new work and perspectives on that end of things. There's really a lot of cool stuff that has been happening, but, but why? What is it about this structure that is useful? Before I give examples, details, let me, let me be philosophical for just a moment or two. 
and say that if we wanted to make something like a, uh, a compass, uh, a, a 2D space of what's useful about these sheaves or what features about these sheaves are useful, then on the one axis, I would label things from algebraic to geometric. Sheaves have both algebraic and geometric features to them different aspects of which may be useful in different problems. But there's another axis that I think is even more important. And this is the structural aspects of sheaves, which is classically what's been used. A lot of uh, almost category theoretic type results. But I think where the real power comes in is in the obstructive nature of these sheaves, by which I mean using sheaf cohomology to be able to say things about solving problems and obstructions to that. In my own work, in my own thinking, I've sort of moved from the lower left-hand corner of the diagram to the upper right-hand corner of the diagram, where I'm now thinking a lot more in terms of both geometric and cohomological features of these cellular sheaves. And that's what I would like to focus on in today's talk, I want to do a little bit of geometry. And this is going to focus on Laplacians and Laplacians for sheaves, how it connects to sheaf cohomology and what it's useful for. We should probably do a little bit of background on Laplacians. This is one of those universal concepts that appears in so many different areas of mathematics. On the combinatorial side, we've seen lots of references in the talk so far to the graph Laplacian, which you can think of as the difference between the, the degree matrix for a graph and the adjacency matrix for a graph, or you can write it in terms of the boundary matrix and its transpose. This is a square matrix on the size of the vertices that is telling you something about the structure of the graph. And this graph Laplacian is absolutely useful in all kinds of different contexts, everything from spectral graph theory to being able to do clustering, consensus, even some more modern applications in graph signal processing often rely on the graph Laplacian. Okay, that's one version of a Laplacian that you may see, you may use, you may teach to your undergraduate students. The other version is, of course, the version of the Laplacian that we teach to our multivariable calculus students, the Hodge Laplacian, in a, a bit of disguise. If we remind ourselves of what that is, if you look at, let's say, a compact orientable finite dimensional manifold, look at the Durham complex of differential forms, then if you've got enough structure to be able to take the adjoint of the differential, of the exterior derivative. A Hodge star would work just fine. Then what you can do is define the so-called Hodge Laplacian as d star d plus d d star. And this gives you access to the topology of your underlying manifold. The Hodge theorem says that the kernel of the Laplacian, the harmonic forms tell you about the cohomology of the manifold in real coefficients. So that's nice. You can understand the topology of a smooth manifold by looking at its harmonic forms. Again, classical story, both in this smooth and in the combinatorial context. Now, what about the sheaves that we've been looking at, which are in a sense, somewhat discrete, being cellular, but which also have a lot of higher structure to them. Well, we can do the same thing, assuming, again, that we have just a little bit of geometry. Let's say that we uh, choose bases for our stocks, our vector spaces, so that we can take a transpose of a matrix. We can take the adjoint of the co-boundary operator for this sheaf cochain complex, then we can use the exact same Hodge Laplacian. We can take the adjoint of the co-boundary operator times the co-boundary operator plus the thing where you switch it the other way. 
This gives you a Laplacian for a cellular sheaf that is truly a generalization of the graph Laplacian. Why? If you take the trivial sheaf, you have a one-dimensional vector space over each cell and identity maps gluing it all together, then this Hodge Laplacian is just the simplicial Laplacian that goes back to, I don't know what, Ekman, uh, something like that. It's the graph Laplacian if you have a one-dimensional base space. The Hodge theorem, again, works. If you take the kernel of this Laplacian, you compute the cohomology. The cohomology of what? The cohomology of the sheaf. That is very nice, and it's going to be very useful to us. And finally, you get access to some very nice geometry here. In the same way that when you're doing uh, the graph Laplacian, you can use things about the principal eigenvalue to tell you how close you are to being a disconnected graph. Well, you can use the sheaf Laplacian here in grading zero to tell you how far away a, co a zero cochain is from being a global section. And that hint at a relationship between spectral graph theory and sheaves actually goes quite far. My recent PhD student, Jacob Hansen, wrote a really nice thesis that went into this in detail, fleshing out what in an initial paper, the two of us called spectral sheaf theory. Oh, who wrote on my screen? That's not nice. Oh, I'll get rid of that guy. Hmm. I do not see how to get rid of that. Oh, but maybe it's not showing up on yours. No, I think it is. That's a bummer. Okay, well, we're just going to have to continue the way that spectral graph theory works. The idea that animates it is that the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian give you a lot of access to the structure of the graph. We can do that in much more generality. In fact, over the past decade or more, there's been a lot of folks using generalizations of the graph Laplacian and looking at the spectral content in order to be able to solve all kinds of really cool problems. All of these generalizations, the graph connection, Laplacian, and more are really just special cases of the sheaf Laplacian. You can do it in much greater generality. I'm not gonna be able to go over all of the results that appear in a, a relatively long paper with Jacob, and I still don't see how to get rid of that mark on the page. How frustrating. But I will point out that if you want to learn a bit more about this, there's tons and tons of detail in the paper that appeared, uh, what, two years ago in JACT. And there's some follow-up work by Jacob that is really good. The reason that I'm not going to dwell on this is because I want to I want to move on to some more current work that Jacob and I have done that has to do with dynamics associated to Laplacians, diffusion dynamics. And this is done in the context of a very particular model. This model has to do with opinion dynamics. And what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is that, I don't know, let's say you've got a social network of individuals. We can model that as an undirected graph, something like Facebook, as opposed to Twitter, which is uh, directed. You can follow me, but I don't necessarily follow you, et cetera. Facebook is bi-directional. In this case, let's assume that everybody has an opinion on some topic. I don't know, pick, pick a topic. What do you think of politician X? Or what do you think of my pink tie that I'm wearing this morning? And some people are like, nope, don't like it. Whereas others might be, yeah, that's, that's fine. I like that politician. And others might just not care. We can turn those states into a real valued preference where not caring corresponds to zero and you have degrees of positive or negative intensity. 
And then the problem is what happens to people's opinions over time, assuming that they influence one another as mediated by the social network. What might happen? Well, everyone might start off with their own opinion. They share that opinion and things might evolve to a polarized state where you have clusters of people agreeing with one another. They might evolve to a consensus state where everyone is sort of moderated, their more extreme opinions. What's going to happen? This is a huge field that is impossible to encapsulate in less than uh, 20 minutes. One of the classical animating results by Taylor 1968 uses the graph Laplacian to come up with a model that is simple diffusion over time. You can write down a continuous time differential equation where x as a function of time t is a vector of these real valued opinions, one for each vertex. And you could discretize this and so come up with a discrete time system. In either case, Taylor's theorem says that every initial condition evolves to consensus, that is locally constant solutions over the network. Now, again, there's, there's been a whole lot that's been done since then. And one of the reasons why there's more work to do is that this result would imply in particular that the more we talk over social networks, the faster we come to agreement over things that we have opinions on. This is not quite the way it seems to work on my Facebook page or my Twitter feed. And so there's a lot more work to be done to explain things like polarization. Now, again, there has been just a flood of work in this area, a lot of it recent, a lot of it having to do with extending the graph Laplacian to structures that allow for dealing with multiple opinions. There have been nonlinear models for the dynamics, things like mm, we influence each other only when we're relatively close. This is called a hexelman krauss type model. There are many, many others in, in addition to models where you, you have people who can lie or who are trolls and are, are purposefully trying to stir things up. A lot of techniques go into opinion dynamics, but most of the important work that is currently being done is using a lot of graph theoretic methods. The models that are being proposed are getting more and more and more complex in order to mirror reality better. One of the things that Jacob Hansen and I wanted to do when we started learning about this was write down a very broad model that would encompass much of what we see in the literature, but which is nevertheless simple enough to be able to prove hard theorems. We have done so using these sheaves and sheaf cohomology and I'd like to give an extended example of that. These are called discourse sheaves. The idea is this. We have a sheaf of vector spaces over a, a social network modeled as a graph. On top of each vertex, there's an opinion space, a vector space of basis opinions, things that I really care about or things that you really care about. But my things that I care about are not necessarily related at all to the things that you really care about. Nevertheless, when we talk, when we're trying to make a decision about something, we're discussing some topics that form the basis of another vector space that may have nothing to do with either of our opinions. But we take our basis opinions and formulate an expression of our opinion on the topics of discourse. Assuming that this is done via linear transformations, we have a sheaf of vector spaces. So the more strongly I hold my opinions, the more strongly I'm going to communicate them. A simple, if somewhat ridiculous example might involve the decision of heading into town to get some lunch, some tapas. Maybe you're hungry, but you're not really in the mood to walk. But maybe in the end, you're like, okay, that might be good. 
Me, on the other hand, if we're talking about tapas, and that means some jamón, that's a vino tinto, then I'm going to be like, yes, let's go. That would be great. Now, of course, this is a simple model, but you should imagine what you could do with a large version of this, where even if we're all discussing the same topics, you could selectively modulate your opinion depending on who you're talking to. You could selectively lie and express the opposite of what you really think depending on who you're talking to. This is one of the things that's so cool about sheaves. And all of these formal structures that we've been working with have very nice interpretations. Zero cochains are private opinion distributions. One cochains are public pairwise discussions. The co-boundary operator, is telling you something about the aggregate public disagreement, the Laplacian is telling you how far away is your set of private opinions from the impacts of your neighbors. And global sections, the zero-dimensional cohomology, literally is harmonic opinion distributions, distributions of opinions that lead to a public expression of agreement. So what do you do with this model? Well, you start proving theorems. And although there's a lot of things that we can prove, the, the principal result, the initial result that gets it started is a generalization of Taylor's theorem. If you set up a heat equation on the zero cochains for a discourse sheaf, either in continuous time or in discrete time, that is everyone modifies their opinions based on comparing the impact of conversations with their neighbors, then as before, every initial condition converges exponentially to the closest harmonic opinion distribution. This is done by orthogonal projection, the same way with the usual kind of Hodge theorem. The proof of this is not that difficult. It has to do with the fact that this Laplacian, like the graph Laplacian is positive semi-definite. And it doesn't imply that everyone believes the same thing. Oh no, it evolves to a state of expressed consensus with private opinions. Now there's a whole lot of other results that are contained in the paper with Jacob that is about to appear in the Siam Journal of Applied Math. Some of these really interesting when you get to issues of control theory. Can you set up propagandists to control the opinions of another subset of the social network? And this is all in terms of obstructions. It's in terms of relative cohomology classes. But one particular result that I think is worth taking maybe a few minutes to go over is concerning the, the realism of this model. Even if we look back at this stupid toy example of what do you want to eat for lunch, then according to this model, what would happen is we discuss what to do for lunch and you change your opinions a little bit and I change my opinions a little bit, but the expression maps remain the same. I don't think that's a really accurate model in all contexts. I'm not going to be changing my opinions on what I think of certain types of food. You're probably not going to be changing your opinion as to how hungry you are based on what I say, unless I start describing the hamon, in which case I might be able to influence your opinion. But instead of fixing the maps and changing private opinions, what if we did things a little differently? What if we fixed the private opinions and changed the way we express them? This gives rise to a dynamical system, not on the zero cochains, but on the space of discourse sheaves. We can again set up a heat equation. This doesn't look like a heat equation, but that Laplacian is really in there that flows the maps, the sheaf maps from the vertex data to the edge data as a function of time, depending on what you hear your neighbors saying to you, 
this heat equation will converge in the space of discourse sheaves to the closest discourse sheaf for which your initial opinion distribution is a global section. So everyone maintains their opinions, but we change the way we express ourselves to get a consensus. And by closest, I mean technical stuff in terms of a norm on the maps. You can see the paper for details. As again, a stupid example of this, let's do what everybody wants to do. What do you think of a certain politician? I won't say who, but you know, you could think of who you might want to talk about and you talk to your neighbors and some, some people feel really strongly and positive. Oh, this person's great. Other people think this guy's a moron. Other people don't care so much. What happens when you talk is there's an expression of sharp disagreement and social pressures mean that over time we modulate the, the way we say our criticisms or the way that we praise certain people. And in the end, we've all learned how to communicate a little bit better. And what happens, what happens in simulations is as with the guy in the middle here, some people learn how to lie in order to get along. I think that's a fairly realistic model. And I think what's so cool about these sheaves is that it can just effort, effortlessly handle those types of situations. Again, this is a toy example, really, really simple. You could imagine much more complex things. Okay, now really everything that I've been talking about so far is still very simple, elementary. These are sheaves over graphs, valued in vector spaces. That's kid stuff from the mathematical point of view. One of the things that I very much want to do is push this out beyond vector space value data to be able to handle more complex sociological effects, structures, one bit of progress in this area is joint work with my PhD student, Hans Ries, that I'm very excited to tell you about. And this is using lattices instead of vector spaces. Now we've seen lattices show up before. These are post sets with a pair of operations, join and meet, that are generalizing things like least upper bound, union max, greatest lower bound, intersection min, to get maps between lattices they naturally come in adjoint pairs where they're, they're, they're going in both directions. That's the kind of thing we need in order to be able to do sheaves and co-sheaves that are valued in lattices. Now you may say, why do, we, why, do we need, why do we need lattices? Who cares about this? Oh, I think this is very, very important. One reason, if you're on the TDA side of things, is the spectacular work by Amit Patel, generalizing persistent homology, using lattices to do some really spectacular work. From the point of view of opinion dynamics, instead of having this total order where there's a degree of intensity of whether you like something or hate it, having a much more complex partial order, ooh, that's, that's maybe much more realistic. And I love the idea of being able to encode logical structures, Boolean algebras, all these things. Yep, lattices, good. So what's the problem? Well, <laughs> how, do, how do you do all the stuff that we've done so far? How do you get a Laplacian? One of the first things that Hans and I did in our paper that has uh, appeared uh, again in Jacked is define a Laplacian for a sheaf of lattices on a graph or a cell complex. You could generalize this to a cell complex, same definition. This does not look like the usual Hodge Laplacian, but trust me, it is. And it really is a Laplacian in the sense that if you take this formula, pull out all the terms that involve a, a local vertex V, and separate those from all the terms that involve the neighbors of V, then you get this structure for this operator on zero cochains that looks like a degree map minus an adjacency map, an expansion term and a mixing term. 
This really looks just like a graph Laplacian. Okay, well, why do we think this really is a good Laplacian? The reason is we can get Hodge theory to work. And the big theorem here is that if you have a sheaf of complete lattices on a graph, what do the global sections look like? What's the analog of zero dimensional cohomology of this sheaf? You can compute it by iterating this Tarski Laplacian over and over. Take any zero cochain, take an element of each vertex lattice and just hit it with this operator. Eventually you will converge to the fixed point set for the identity map meet that Laplacian. This looks just like a discrete time heat equation. It is a discrete time heat equation. And what this means is that the global sections are a complete quasi sublattice of the zero cochains. And in particular, it's non empty. This is not at all obvious from first principles. We call this the Tarski fixed point theorem or the Hodge Tarski fixed point theorem because it has certain historical resonances with the classical Tarski fixed point theorem for lattices, but it's very, very general. Now you might say, okay, well, that's uh, the global sections. That's H upper zero. What about higher dimensional cohomology? Well, the bad news is there is no higher dimensional cohomology. It's, it's not defined. This category of lattices and connections is not an abelian category. You, you can't do kernels mod images here. Can't set up a coaching complex. But we can try to do Hodge theory. That definition of the Laplacian works just fine for a higher dimensional cell complex, same definition. So what we could do is say, you know what? Let's just consider the harmonic K cochains, look at the fixed point set of the identity, meet this K dimensional Laplacian operator. And let's just call that the K dimensional Hodge Tarski cohomology. And once again, from the same proof of the Tarski fixed point theorem, we have that this is a non-empty, complete quasi sublattice of the k-dimensional cochains. This is not an honest cohomology theory by any means, but it is an interesting candidate for what you might be able to do to define cohomology of such sheaves. Now, that is not the end. I think there's much more that can be done. We have some work in progress that is not yet, uh, not yet written up and out there that is extending this yet further to more general categories. There's some really fantastic work that is being done by my postdoc Paige Randall North. She is absolute expert and pushing this stuff way up beyond what Hans and I and Jacob and I have done. And I look forward to telling you some more about that in the future, but we're not gonna be doing that today. Today, I'm gonna wrap things up by thanking all the people in my group who worked together to contribute to some really cool stuff in applied topology. Again, the results that you've heard today are joint with Jacob Hansen and Hans Rees, and there's some stuff on the way, joint with Page North. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, I already see that there are a couple of questions out there. Um, Guo Wei, Wei, do you, I, I see you wrote it, but maybe you want to ask it. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an excellent talk. I, I think you discuss, discussed about the, the hard Laplacian and also shift la Laplacian, but uh, I missed the, the detail. What's the difference over there? So the Hodge Laplacian is classically for a manifold working with the, um, the Durham complex of differential forms on that manifold. Of course, if you have any cochain complex where you can take an adjoint of the co boundary map, you can form something like a Laplacian. You can take 
the co-boundary map, its add joint, and then add what you get doing it the other way. Assuming you're in an abelian category where you know how to add, in this case, you get what ought to be called a, a Laplacian, a Hodge Laplacian maybe, in the context of sheaves, cellular sheaves, where we have a natural coaching complex. If there's enough geometry in your stocks to be able to take an adjoint of the co-boundary map, then you have an immediate sheaf Laplacian, which I sometimes call a Hodge Laplacian, just because this gets used a lot in Hodge theory and algebraic geometry. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Marce, did I pronounce your name correct? Uh, hello, Professor, and thank hello, you very Marcy. much for the very interesting talk. Uh, actually, my question is a bit related to what was asked. Um, if you consider your simplicial complex to be a triangulation of a manifold, is there any uh, way to approximate the linear maps of your sheaves or the Laplacian of your sheaves, uh, sheaves to the uh, a smooth case? Uh, can you approximate these things if you consider a triangulation? of the manifold. And another question that I have is that uh, what you have done here is about the Laplacian on, uh, of shifts on the networks. Can you extend uh, this, uh, this approach to uh, some geometric uh, notions such as curvature or less geometric notions like clustering coefficients? If you want to know what are the clusters of your upper level data, uh, can you extend this approach to uh, other notions which are already there and very useful. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna to try to remember all that and answer your questions for the first one. If you have a, uh, a manifold that is say triangulated, has some nice cell structure on it, and you look at a constant sheaf, that is you just attach a one-dimensional vector space to every cell, and you glue them together with identity maps. Then in that case, the sheaf cohomology gives you the same as the ordinary cohomology of your underlying space. If you, if you do this uh, sheaf Laplacian and compute uh, the harmonic cochains, then you get, again, just, just the ordinary stuff. So it is a way to discretize what is happening in the smooth case. Although you can have much more complex sheaves, much more complex data structures, then you get some more interesting things that you don't see on the smooth level necessarily. As to the second question, can you use the, the higher dimensional uh, Laplacians for things like, uh, like clustering, like doing, um, interesting things with data. The answer there is absolutely yes. And this is something that others have been doing for years using somewhat more specialized Laplacians. If you look at work by uh, Cheyenne Mukherjee, who's gonna be speaking next. If you look at work by Singer Bandeira, uh, they have all used Laplacians to do higher order applications in data science. And there's some really excellent work there. Now, I think that there's yet more that one could do by going beyond these more uh, rigid types of Laplacians to just an arbitrary sheaf Laplacian, where you have really, really big, complex, interesting sheaves. But that is work that remains to be done. Thank you very much. Massimo. Hi, Rob. Um, actually, in the social networks, I don't see uh, so much smooth things uh, or opinions. I rather see quite often um, positive feedback uh, phenomena. How do you frame uh, this uh, into uh, the Laplacian model? M maybe with resonances? So, if I run a heat equation, if I use the Laplacian just straight up in the simplest possible way, these are linear dynamics and they're not all that 
interesting, as evidenced by Taylor's result. Interesting is not the right word. They're not all that um, realistic. They, they, they don't line up with the polarization that we see. One of the finer points that Jacob and I put in this paper is that you can use these discourse sheaf models. You can modify the Laplacian dynamics just a little bit and recover the classical Hegsum and Krauss models where you only diffuse if you start off sufficiently close and otherwise you're not affected. That leads to strong polarization, but there's a huge amount of work that I think is yet to be done looking at nonlinear dynamics on these discourse sheaves. A lot to be done there. Wojciech. Yes. Uh, so, I, okay, this is like maybe a petty question, but you know, like, why do you call, I asked you that before uh, this question, why do you call them sheaves and co-sheaves? I mean, so, and the reason I'm asking this is, you know, why not call them functors, okay? The re or representations, because, you know, very, very often you deal with, uh, with uh, just, you know, vector space uh, representations. The reason I'm saying this is because there's an extensive, like really extensive work from 50s till 90s, where people have studied, uh, you know, cohomology of such fun homology or cohomology of such functors. And there's really, that's been, you know, just like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers and, you know, many people. And, uh, and of course, the reason that sometimes topologies use sheaf and co sheaf because, you know, you really want to, you know, encode the geometry. It's not just a functor. Okay, but in this case, it's just functors, right? Like, why, why insist on calling it sheaves and cauches, not functors, as it was, you know, done for forty years? Like, That's a great question. I have two reasons. The first being that I very explicitly want to be including more geometric information. I think that's where these things really get useful. And the second is I really want to import a lot of the, the ideas, the, the, the modes of thinking that sheaf theorists have developed. I'm not trying to ignore work that has been done on, on various functor categories. And in fact, I think some of the work that is gonna be coming out in the next six months is, is gonna be a little bit more strongly categorical in nature, but I very much, and for a long time, I've had a vision of pulling in ideas, perspectives, and techniques from sheaf theory and pushing them over into applications. Thank you. Are there any more questions? All right, Rob, thanks. That was, that was great.